One thing you should understand is I worked in the World Trade Center for 10 years. So I was intimately knowledgeable about the site and the buildings around it and everything else. So it made sense for me to be there. I was one of the more senior pilots around also. So that made sense in addition. And so consequently, um, I was picked to be uh, the co-pilot or what we call the, the observer. Uh, there was another pilot uh, who actually drove the bus, if, as you will, um, and that was Jacques Heinrich. He was a lieutenant colonel, and to Andrew Feld Feldman, who was a backup photographer and was sitting in the rear seat in a, in a role that we call scanner, okay? And so, anyway, uh, we were notified that we were needed to to do this mission. We were selected to do the mission. And, uh, you know, again, all the facts for getting ready for the mission were already with us because we, we knew the site so well. I, um, as the observer, the observer kind of controls the flight, the pilot flies it, and the scanner uh, logs and backs up the observer, okay? I also handle radio work, uh, navigation, those kinds of things. So um, we prepared for it. We got permission from the military to, to launch. Uh, they in turn uh, notified the Federal Aviation Agency, FAA, that we were allowed to take off. And we, we took off and headed towards you know, the Trade Center. First of all, going there, we flew from where we were in the middle of Long Island to right overhead Kennedy Airport, which is on the south shore of Queens. And um, I looked down and it was eerie because you couldn't see a mouse moving on the ground. Not a car, not an airplane, not a person even. No one was, was on the field which if you know Kennedy Airport, that's a busy, busy place between cargo and passengers, you name it. So um, that, was, that was weird. And then I looked out into the ocean and you could see the John F. Kennedy battle group all out there protecting the New York area. Um, and on aircraft, there's a device called a transponder. And the transponder, basically gives information back to air traffic control. So their radar can say, okay, he's that way, but on the other hand, it doesn't give a sense of altitude or who you are. A transponder takes care of that. It tells the altitude and it tells who you are. That, every time it gets interrogated, has a little light on it and it flashes. And I'm used to, as a pilot, I'm used to flash, 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 flash. Well, in this case, it was come on, don't go off. It stayed on. We were constantly being tracked. And it was from the John F. Kennedy Battle Group, just in case we were another bad guy. And so that was a, a strange feeling. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, boy, these guys better not make a mistake because that's, that, that's bad news for us. But they didn't. They knew who we were and why we were. And I asked air traffic control to give us what's called a vector to the World Trade Center. And the answer I got back was, you own the sky. There's no one else up here. Go wherever you want. So I said, OK. I instructed the pilot you know, what to do, what angles to fly, and so on. Uh, we got to the World Trade Center and smoke was bellowing out of the, you know, destruction. Um, we noticed other buildings around it were in equally poor shape as a result of the Trade Center coming down. And uh, we began our mission, which was to orbit and photograph uh, the Trade Center site. I wish I never had had to go on that mission. I wish it had never happened. So. You know, although I was trained to do it, although I did do it, 
I wish I had, there was no reason to do it, but I did. And at the time when I was doing it, you know, I, it, it was muscle memory. It was, you know, this is what I've been trained to do. This is what I'm going to do. I didn't think about people I might have known, people, you know, how many people didn't make it. I didn't think about any of that. I just thought about the mission. It was days later that that all came into my mind. But, uh, so it was that. Seeing it being honored, it's nice. It, it, it's nice, it makes me feel warm. I wasn't, you know, ignored by, by everybody. I, I love seeing the fact that the plane is in fact here in the museum. That, I think that's important that it was retired here because it had a critical role in our country's history now. And so, um, you know, I, I feel proud to have been part of that. And to be honored by it and hear all these great words, that's real nice. But again, that's not the reason I did it. I did it because that was my job to do. And uh, it just turned out to be beneficial to everyone after the fact. The smoke was a little rough. I mean, first of all, it made it harder to take pictures <laughs> right off the bat. And secondly, it, um, uh, you know, you didn't know what was in that smoke that you were. It was coming in the ventilation system of the plane. And so you don't know. We had to fly low because, and that's why we were commissioned to do this. Fighter jets fly fast and, and being low with big buildings around us is not real healthy. So consequently what, what happened was, um, you know, we, the highest we were was maybe 1,200 feet above the ground, which is sea level at that point. And um, the lowest we went was about 800. And it was, it was too dangerous to be around some of those other skyscrapers lower than that. But, and, and then we tried to take some pictures. Some of the orbits we did were close in, so we could take very good shots of the, of the debris and, and so on. And then other times um, it was further out, so we could give a sense of the background, where we are, when this shot was taken, you know, what was the angle, what's behind it, you could, re you know, relate to, you know, scope. You know, so that's, that was really the mission. That was uh, the, the flight path. And it was all right turns. You know, we circled to the right because I was taking pictures out of the right side. So I had uh, Jacques Heinrich, Colonel Heinrich, um, uh, fly circles to the right. And, you know, we did that until we thought we had enough uh, photographs taken. Basically, on September 11th, I got home from work. I was working for an aerospace contractor in Long Island, working on hardware for the AWACS program. Immediately when everything happened, I went home, I turned on my radio, HF radio, and was in contact with CAP's National Operations Center. I was also in contact with FEMA on HF radio. On Eastern Long Island, when the Trade Center went down, Verizon Engineering put all of the fiber optics for New York City and the whole metro area in the basement of the World Trade Center won. Okay, we lost TV, we lost telephone, uh, we lost radio, we lost all of our internet. Pound it back to the 18th century. So how were things done? We had a little, uh, very small capacity phone line from Norwalk, Connecticut, across the Sound to Eastern Long Island. My boss at the time, Colonel Greenhut, he was uh, the region commander. He had been my wing commander at the time, and three weeks earlier, he became the region commander. He calls me. We need to get a, a flight mission together to do photography of New York State, of New York City, on the Trade Center. Okay. Uh, at the time, my position within New York Wing was a director of communications. 
So now I had to say, what do we need to do to pull the mission off since the boss is too far away? So first thing I did, one of our members was a air traffic route manager for the FAA, Colonel Paper. He uh, passed away a few years ago. He pulled the magic of trying to get us coordinated to fly. Once that was done, my next task, who's going to fly this darn thing? So therefore, I've flown a lot of hours between Colonel Raddus and Colonel Heinrich. They were my first choices. The next task is, what airplane are we going to fly? We got four of them based at Long Island MacArthur. So 4-4 Lima was chosen as being the most stable, most up-to-date, well-maintained aircraft. That was the decision made. We were all congregated, let's get 4-4 Lima ready. Uh, we had, it was a, this is the typical government thing, it was hurry, hurry up and wait. By about 11 o'clock in the morning, we were together, we had all the logistics, then the thought came up, how are we gonna get 52 gallons of Avgas? The airport shut down. I had some connections, we pulled it together, we got a truck over, we got 52 gallons of Avgas, we were ready to fly. With one exception, we were waiting for orders to fly. The orders came from the White House. First presidentially ordered mission for CAP ever to fly. The mission itself was the first non-peacetime mission that CAP flew since December 7th, 1941. Rarified atmosphere. We never do things like that. We did. Uh, 1.30 we took off and then we uh, flew to Manhattan. We met an F-15 as our escort. Uh, then how do you communicate with an F-15? They're operating different radios. So we did some hand signals on one of their passes. Uh, 121.5 is the international guard frequency. We figured it out by hand signals. One, two, one, five. Oh, I can understand from that. Click the radios on. We're now in, in touch with our escorts. We proceeded then to do uh, four orbits out of Manhattan. Uh, we flew from South Ferry north to Canal Street, across Canal Street to uh, the East River, flew down the East, East River over the uh, uh, Manhattan Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, by uh, New York City Hall, uh, down to South Ferry, and we started the loop all over again. Uh, each orbit that we had, we were getting more and more details. Some of the best photography we did was on our third orbit. We got pictures at, from 750 feet. We were flying directly over the pile. We were looking at NYPD, NYFD, plus a cacophony of you name the agency. They were all scrambling all over the pile like uh, uh, ants trying to uh, uh, pick up the first candy bar that hit the ground. They're looking up at us, we're looking down at them. We did those flights, and then when that was done, we headed back to Islet MacArthur Airport. Yeah, we had interference from NYPD Air 9, which is the aviation unit. That was solved because we got a command call, and they, they were contacted by New York State Police, they're real, it's a real mission, let them fly, and we did. Uh, we uh, got back to Islip McCarthy Airport and we were escorted, up, the minute our wheels went down, we had the FAA, the FBI, the Suffolk County Police Department, and a couple of other agencies. We were chased by about 15 to 20 vehicles chasing us. Why were we flying? Who authorized it? Who are you? And I had one cop say, give me your driver's license. And I said, no, I wasn't driving. So uh, it evolved. Basically what we did is I asked the cop to, get, uh, to join me into our mission base. He turned around and I said, we're making one phone call to state emergency management office. Call them within five minutes, maybe less than five minutes, he got a call on his radio, back off, that was a real mission. And then uh, Colonel Raddus and I, we divided up the digital films that we took, and we only had maybe 26 pictures, 25 pictures, they were digital. 
uh, using an old-fashioned Kodak DC 340. I had the Nikon camera in my possession where I got some of the high-resolution pictures. Now what do I do? This is now 5 o'clock in the evening. Where are you going to get the films developed? So next morning, first thing, I got up. I had a photo processor right near the house. I made him swear to me he was not going to look at the films. He was not going to share the films or transmit the films. Just develop them and give them back to me. And I showed him my CAP ID. This is a real mission. He did everything I asked him to. Then I had the uh, original color contact photos. I had to digitize those in the house and then send them up to Colonel Greenhut at FEMA Region 1, which were later distributed to the whole cacophony of who's who. And that's how we pulled off the mission. I'm humbled at the fact the airplane is here, but the aircraft itself was now reaching end of service life. And I'm just flattered to see 44 Lima still lives here in the collection. It's a lasting remembrance of what we did. I have to touch the airplane before I leave. 9-11 um, to me, I, it was like a gut punch. Somebody destroyed, attacked my city. I've been living there almost my whole life in various parts of the New York area. Both my wife and I came from Brooklyn. We got married. We, uh, uh, took a, I took a position within the Atomic Energy Commission uh, down in Princeton, New Jersey. The same location, if you saw the movie Oppenheimer, we were on that campus. Uh, did, oh, close to 10 years on that duty assignment and then transferred out to Eastern Long Island to build an atom smasher the largest one in the United States. So yeah, we've lived in the area, we worked in the area, we played in the area, we grew up in the area. So yes, it was a gut punch and still hurts. I get around the beginning of September and I'm going, oh my gosh, it's coming back again. And it's, if you haven't seen anything with this type of disaster, you're socked in the gut and it's something which is burnt into your mind that you had to live with this. We did it. The answer is we got the phone call, we got the mission, we prosecuted the mission, we brought the bacon home. We flew multiple search and rescue missions. One of the things that CAP does is we search emergency locator transmitters. Every boat, every uh, aircraft has got an ELT on board. So we had to fly missions to find this stuff. We've flown a lot of missions, so we became very friendly. And that's why I said I had to choose the air crew with my choice. We got the right air crew, the right equipment, and we flew.